Mikhail Gorbachev said it first, then Boris Yeltsin. The Soviet Union, or Russia, or whatever you want to call it these days, was going to make the leap from communism to a market economy by beating its swords into plowshares, by taking its massive military-industrial complex and converting it into badly needed civilian production. The rest of the world applauded, breathed a sigh of relief, and declared a peace dividend. Only it's a lot easier said than done, and the Russians aren't even saying it anymore. In fact, they're getting ready to flood the world market with military hardware. The decision's got nothing to do with world politics, it's strictly business. This plant in Moscow is one of 2,500 factories and research facilities which used to make up the Soviet version of the military industrial complex. It made proton rockets for the space program, but there aren't many orders these days, so they're trying to get by making pumps to bottle milk. This plant in the Ukraine was designed to produce ICBM missiles. So far, the only civilian use anyone's been able to find for them is to take the nose cones and make sausage machines out of them. How difficult is it to take one of these factories and convert them to civilian use? If it took God seven days to create the, uh, the world, he would have to work another three or four days to do that same thing with these industries. Jeffrey Barry ought to know. He's a retired military attache with the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and one of the few Americans buying anything of value from Russian industry. It's this tiny, funny-looking airplane, which is being put together in a small workshop on the grounds of the huge state-owned aerospace company, Sukhoi. The Su-26 was designed by Sukhoi for the Soviet aerobatic flying team back in 1984, and it's won more than 74 gold medals. It's the airborne equivalent of a Ferrari, with a worldwide market of about 30 airplanes a year. Barry's company, the Pompano Air Center of Pompano Beach, Florida, has bought the entire production run. How important is this little plane to Sukhoi? Well, as far as we know, it's their major source of revenue right now, and it's worth uh, $10 million a year for them. All hard currency. All hard currency. But this $10 million is not enough to feed 20,000 people. This design bureau, Sukhoi Design Bureau, has 20,000 employees. And all they do is design airplanes. They don't build airplanes. This place that we are here... 20,000 just for design? Just for designing the airplane. And what this room here that we're in is where they used to build the models for the airplanes that they would design. Then they would turn it over to a factory that would have 60,000 people in it that would do nothing but build airplanes. Well, they've got too many people working for them. They've got two-thirds too many people working for them. The factories, the huge state-owned companies, are like dinosaurs, Barry says, too big and too inefficient to survive. A few years ago, this Moscow factory built 20 MiG-29 fighter bombers a month, but its main customer, the Soviet Union, went out of business. There are only three MiGs left on the assembly line and no buyers for them. So now, the plant's chief engineer told us, some of the most skilled workers in the country are making surgical beds and a primitive, ultralight airplane that was designed by a group of former students at the Institute for Aviation. Vitaly Shlikov is a deputy minister of defense. What's going to happen to that factory when those three MiGs leave the factory? Well, it will go on receiving salaries for the employees. That's quite obvious. So the factory will still be there? Yes, yeah, certainly. And the people that work for the factory will still be there? Will be there. Who pays them? The government. To do nothing? To do nothing. But at least they are not using up raw materials and valuable components and things like that. Still, in the long run, it's a saving. How long can the new government afford to pay millions of disgruntled defense workers to do nothing? Shlikov thinks maybe a year. But that's not the problem. The problem is that the people who own uh, be staying idle for a whole year. They'll go out into the street and start uh, sort of a campaign of their own. They're organized in the military way. A political campaign? Yes. They are running practically lots of towns and even cities. In Moscow alone, you have more than one million people employed by the defense industry. Try to stop them. To keep those workers off the streets, President Yeltsin decided to give in. He let the military-industrial complex try to sell what it makes best, 
and hopefully earn enough money to get into some other line of work. How much does the company want for this? <laughs> 25 millions. Oh, 25 million dollars. <laughs> yes, dollars. Uh, what'll it do? How fast will it go? На высоте 2500. 2500 kilometers per hour. Yeah. Meet Valery Manitsky, one of the best pilots in the world and the chief test pilot for the Mikoyan Design Group, which makes the MiG-29. Not too long ago, the United States would have killed to get its hands on one of these planes. Now they can simply buy one. Like almost everything else in Russia, this baby's for sale. You think you'll sell a lot of these? We have sold a lot of them and we hope to sell much more. Can we take it for a test drive? Yes. <laughs> it's just. <yes. laughs> there are no glossy brochures yet. The Russians know as much about sales and marketing as the West does about running a planned economy. As far as the test ride, money is so tight here, they insisted we pay for the gas and maintenance. And the MiG-29 is not exactly an economy model. The bill for 20 minutes flying time was $6,000. But the plane is one of the fastest, most agile fighter bombers ever built. The Russians probably have more good engineers and scientists than any other country in the world. Not even the Japanese can duplicate this plane yet. It can fly at two and a half times the speed of sound in a straight line or do somersaults. You can buy it stripped down or loaded up with extras like rockets, bombs, and air-to-air -air missiles. It was designed to discourage a coup, put down a small rebellion, or compete on the battlefield with an F-16, British Tornado, or French Mirage, providing the pilot knows what he's doing. But whether the Russians can compete with Lockheed, General Dynamics, and McDonnell Douglas in the marketplace is another matter. Rostislav Belyakov is the head of the Mikoyan Design Bureau and a father, some say czar, of modern Soviet military aviation. He hopes to design a line of civilian aircraft with money earned from the MiG sales. Who would you like to sell to? Uh, we could sell to Malaysia. We could sell to Germany. Libya? Oh, Olivia, it is uh, questions. It is questions. Oh, grand questions. What about Iran? Iran, тоже надо подумать. Iran? We'd have to think about that. Yes. In fact, some MiG-29s have already been sold to Iran, and Belyakov said the only countries he'd rule out as customers are Iraq and Yugoslavia because of UN embargoes. Everyone else is fair game. I think uh, it, uh, it will competition. But the biggest competition for the Russian arms makers may come from their own armed forces. The Army, the Navy, and the Air Force have received permission to sell off their own slightly used tanks, fighter planes, even battleships to pay for military housing and salaries. The Russian hardware, brand new or pre-owned, may not be as good or as reliable as what's available in the West, but it will be a good deal cheaper. Mikhail Malay is a top defense advisor to President Boris Yeltsin. He'd sell everything except nuclear secrets and chemical weapons. <coughs> we can sell at 10% of the price of our competitors, and there will still be a profit. 90% cheaper than the United States? Just compare the salaries of a Soviet worker and an American worker, the rate of exchange between the ruble and the dollar. Compare the figures and you will have an answer. Our workers make four dollars a month. Can you compete in terms of servicing and spare parts, uh, things like that, that customers in the world market are going to, to want and demand? For us, it's absolutely a new field and very important. We hope to be able to cope with it and have already taken preliminary steps. What Mr. Malay wants to do is to flood the world with as many cheap Russian arms as the market will bear. 
and then reinvest the profits in places like Izhevsk, the heart of the military-industrial complex on the edge of the Ural Mountains. It's a city of 700,000 people, and about half the workforce here is employed in the defense industry. At huge factories like this one, which makes, among other things, one of the most famous assault rifles in the world, the Kalashnikov. The idea is to turn the entire region into a high-tech weapons mecca that would earn hard currency to be shared by the workers, the factories, and the local governments. Everyone would have a share. According to Pavel Felgenhauer, a Russian defense analyst, the factories here may have already jumped the gun. Are they still making arms here? Of course they're still making arms. I thought there was supposed to be no government orders. Well, there are no government orders, but I understand the arms are made. Though maybe no one will tell you officially, but of course arms are made. Well, many of these factories simply don't know what to do else. If the factories are still making arms that the government hasn't ordered, what's happening to those weapons? Well, Felgenhauer and a lot of others speculate that they're being sold on the black market by freelance operators with good government connections. Well, as it stands right now, the, the Army and the Air Force are talking about selling weapons that they've already got. Yeah. Uh, the uh, design groups are talking about selling the weapons. The factories want to sell the weapons. The government wants to sell the weapons. Can all these people sell weapons? I th I'm, I'm afraid there's going to be quite a stampede in the coming uh, months, and uh, it might be, I think it'll end up very nasty. Uh, they'll clog up the world market with arms, and uh, for, of course for the world it also won't be a very good predicament with so many arms around, floating around. This is not exactly the best time to be selling Russian arms. The world market is glutted, and after the Gulf War, this is one area where people want to buy American. There has been interest, though, from the Chinese, the Iranians, the Indians, and the Libyans. Sales figures are unavailable. That kind of data used to be called intelligence. Now, it's competitive information. <laughs>